Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Lockdown Learning. My name is Beren Carlil, and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zions Federation of Australia. We are delighted to have Naftali Bennett as our guest tonight. Now, before I introduce him, I want to remind you that next week, our guest will be Yaakov Katz, the editor of the Jerusalem Post, and also a really good defense and security analyst. As you know, our guest tonight is Neftali Bennett. Neftali served in the Special Forces of the IDF. He then thrived in Israel's high-tech sector before selling his company and moving into politics. Serving initially in Bibi Netanyahu's office, he launched his own party and has found political success ever since. Neftali joined the Knesset just seven years ago as the leader of Jewish Home, but in the short time since, he has served as Minister for Diaspora Affairs, Minister for the Economy, Minister for Religious Services, Minister for Education, and Minister for Defence. In the wake of the last election, he chose to move to opposition rather than join Netanyahu's coalition with Blue White. Tonight, Neftali will be speaking with Jeremy Liebler, President of the Zionist Federation of Australia, and who, like me, is still locked down here in Melbourne. Neftali is unfortunately likely unable to join us for the full hour this evening. So with no further ado, I'll turn the conversation over to Jeremy. Thanks, Bren, for the introduction. And Naftali, thank you for joining us. Um, I still vividly remember your visit to Australia. I think you were Minister for Diaspora Affairs. In fact, you were accompanied by Yaakov Katz at the time, who I think was your advisor. And um, it was a bit of a rock star visit. You made, a, um, made your presence known, um, both within the Jewish community and the general community. So we, are, we really are delighted to have you tonight with us. Um, Maybe we can start, you know, it's interesting. I think many people who, um, you know, haven't Googled you um, would assume that you were actually born outside of Israel. Um, and maybe it's your English, your fluent English, the time you spent in, in Chutzlaritz. But there's also a sense that perhaps more so than some of your Israeli colleagues, you also have a quite a, a, a depth of understanding of the, the Jewish diaspora. Um, and so I want to touch on sort of Israel diaspora relations um, in a minute, but maybe we can just start off and you are in fact a Sabri, you were born in Haifa and your parents um, made Aliyah just after the six day war. Maybe just tell us briefly how sort of growing up um, at that time with parents who, you know, I think it was, it was almost weeks or a few months after the six day war. So it really was um, a, a, an, an incredible time to, <laughs> to be moving to live in Israel. Tell us a little bit how your upbringing shaped your worldview today? Well, uh, I'd be happy to. First of all, I want to uh, thank uh, everyone for joining this. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, um, I visited Australia uh, twice and I fell in love with uh, Australia, the people, and especially the Jewish community in Australia. I'm not saying this to kiss up to you. I don't say it to everyone. Uh, this is specific the Jewish community uh, in Sydney, in Melbourne, the degree of love to Eretz Israel, Am Israel, the, the Zionism, it's just amazing. And, and I, I have to say, you know, Baruch Hashem, I live in Israel, but man, Australia is a good place. Um, and and uh, so I have a very warm spot in my heart uh, for, for Australia and the, the Jewish community in Australia. And that's why uh, notwithstanding the, the uh, very uh, uh, tough time that we're all experiencing, I, I thought it was important to join. Um, for me, the Jewish people and Israel is, is totally intertwined. We're one. Um, and I didn't have to learn this. I just grew up with this. Uh, my, my parents, uh, uh, Jim Zichro Livracha and Myrna, may she continue living healthily in Haifa. Um, they were totally secular, zero connection to, uh, to Yiddishkeit and, and the state of Israel, you know, that small uh, country in a desert with camels back then. Uh, but something happened to them uh, during the, the, the uh, Six Day War, in fact, uh, prior to the Six Day War, there was a sense that that little Jewish state will be, uh, um, you know, overrun and annihilated by, uh, by the Arab countries around. And though both of them were then uh, uh, peace uh, activists and human rights activists, I'm very proud of that, 
they became obsessed with the Jewish state. And on the first civilian plane back to Israel, or to Israel, after the Six Day War, they came, they volunteered on a kibbutz, and ultimately stayed in Israel. And it's a very long story how, how I uh, ultimately got a kippah, as you see. Um, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, I, I view one of the top missions of the state of Israel now in 2020 to, to uh, strengthen and build a, a eternal relationship with the Jews abroad. Yeah, I'd love everyone to make aliyah, and if we're at it, make aliyah. But I, at the same time, I, I recognize that lots of people won't make aliyah. That, that's, you know, that's reality. And, and we have to create a, a very strong relationship, not only that the Jews of the world, uh, uh, you know, donate money to Israel, but we have to respect uh, the communities around the world and, and, and create, you know, the next generation of, of uh, world Jewry. If I were prime minister, I would view myself as, yes, prime minister of the citizens of Israel, Arabs and Jews, etc., but also the leader of the Jewish people, whether they live in Israel or not. It's a, it's a unique uh, situation, and, and uh, that's why I, I volunteered twice to be a, a minister of diaspora affairs, which was not considered, um, uh, you know, very uh, luxurious uh, uh, ministry, but because I care. And, uh, and we have to learn together uh, how to build this, uh, this uh, you know, big uh, uh, challenge for the next hundreds of years. Yeah. And I think, you know, ch challenge is the right word because, you know, while on the one hand, um, y you know, we're probably, in some respects, we're living in a golden age, um, you know, in the diaspora. And a lot of that is by virtue of the fact that we have a strong state of Israel. Um, but at the same time, we do have challenges and particularly American Jewry um, and Israel um, have had a series of, of challenges, and you know, most you know, most recently, the last few days, um, you, you may have seen uh, an American commentator, Peter Beinart, who for, for a long time has has been on the sort of I would say the sort of extreme fringe, but you know, one foot in, one foot out, um, depending on one's perspective. But he he published a, an op-ed in the New York Times and a more in-depth article that, in effect, you know, I think it's fair to say. He ceased being a Zionist. He 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 has given up on um, on the the vision of a Jewish state. Now, Sally, how, how do you think we got there? Because we're not there in Australia. It's quite a different, fundamentally a different community. We have other challenges, but from our vantage point here, American Jewry has has been sort of on a steep decline in the way in which maybe if we exclude the Orthodox sort of parts of the community there, but but outside of the Orthodox, steep decline when it comes to its relationship with Israel. How do you think we got there? Um, and, and does Peter Beinart's article sort of signal, you know, a normalization of, um, of, of that sort of view of, of the world and Israel as, you know, effectively calling for a, a, a binational state? Is that, is that a sign of what's to come from US Jewry in the next 10, 15 years? I don't know who this guy is. I don't that, care about- And that is really, really telling because, you know, before, the, his article has exploded in the diaspora, and I actually went to look in the Hebrew press, and I couldn't see one article. No, I'm, one I'm, article uh, about it. I, I, I know who the person is. My point is, I, I don't want to, he doesn't deserve any uh, attention. He's uh, one of those uh, people who just is always provocative and uh, trying to seek attention. But to the actual phenomenon that we're talking about, which does exist, uh, and, and I would talk about the chasm uh, between um, Israel and, and the parts of the diaspora. It's a real challenge. The, the challenge uh, is, is primarily, uh, uh, it's not a political one, it's a fundamental uh, a social one. Why? In uh, most of the um, Western world, the younger generation typically moves more to the liberal uh, uh, side of things. Whereas in Israel, the younger generation tends to be on the more conservative, even more uh, right-wing than the parents. Uh, why is that? There's gotta be many reasons, but one of them 
is reality. Uh, we live reality in Israel. We uh, have lived through, you know, so many rounds of uh, terror and the disappointment of, of the illusion of if we just hand over more land to the Arabs, somehow uh, it'll bring peace when in fact uh, we paid the price. And, and the kids who, who today are coming to age, you know, uh, 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, they, they were born into the post-Oslo uh, reality and it failed. We tried it. The, the, the state of Israel and the Israeli public actually tried not once, but twice, the notion of handing land over to Arabs and hoping that will bring peace. And in fact, it brought the, the, the Intifada, uh, which was just terrible. When, when after Oslo, we got the, the second Intifada. And in Gaza, we handed it over to the Palestinians. We expelled the Jews, pulled back to the 1967 lines, pulled out the army, gave the keys to Mahmoud Abbas. We did everything by the book. And we've been suffering tens of thousands of, of rockets being shot at us from the very land we handed over. So we're, we're less, uh, uh, we're, we're disillusioned, we know reality. Not to say we're pessimistic, we're not. Israel is an, an incredibly optimistic place. You can see it by the number of kids we've got. It's, it's the only Western country with a positive uh, uh, demographic growth. Everyone around is having three and four and five kids not only uh, uh, orthodox, but also secular. Uh, the, and, and the, you know, barring the, the corona, which we can talk about, the COVID-19, uh, we've been seeing tremendous growth over the past uh, decade. Uh, so we're very optimistic, but there's been a chasm. Now, the way to deal with it is not to say we're right or you're right. It's to talk. It's to talk. That, that's what we need. We need to be in touch. We need to see things as they're viewed from abroad. We need the younger generation abroad to see things as they're viewed here. And especially talk about what it means to be Jewish in 2020. What's our mission? Why, why is it important to be Jewish beyond the mere fact that you are Jewish as a fact, right? Uh, uh, I basically, on a fundamental level, without philosophy, when a Jew hurts, in Melbourne, or in New York, or in Latvia, or, or, or in Israel, I care. It hurts. When, when someone hurts there, it hurts. I don't know why, but it just does. It's a, you know, you don't ask. But that, that's not enough. We, we need to think a level beyond just the arvuta dadit of what's our mission? And, and, and together to, to, you know, think through this, and, and, and build the vision for the next hundreds of years in this new era. And it's difficult, right? Because, you know, I think you're right in the sense that I can tell you, <laughs> um, you know, uh, young uh, Israelis, you know, 18 to 25 year olds certainly have a very different experience than those in the diaspora. I've got two nephews in Israel who are serving in the IDF at the moment. Um, and of course, I've got nephews in Australia as well. And it's, and it's fundamentally a very t different life and perspective and so it's not surprising but I suppose in order to have that conversation and that conversation is really important you need to well as a starting position speak the same language um, you need to have something in common and like you said there needs to be this sense of common purpose and I think one of the challenges in the diaspora particularly you know in Israel you have it because it's all around you it's you know you're sort of consuming it every time you get into a taxi or you get onto a bus but in the diaspora, it's quite different. And I think particularly in America, you know, in, in the United States, there is um, uh, a difference in sort of basic Jewish literacy, which makes it hard to have that conversation. Um, really difficult. And then, so you've got those challenges. And to some degree, they're there. We can't fix them with a, you know, with a click of our fingers. But there are points of tension in the diaspora um, that aren't even politically um, related. It's not to do with being left wing or right wing. Um, in a political sense, but things to do with um, the different expressions of, of Judaism, for example, you know, the, the, the affair with the uh, egalitarian um, prayer space at the Kotel and the government's reversal of that position. Um, you know, most recently we've had um, the, the Safari chief rabbi describe reform Judaism as fake and falsified. 
Um, and, you know, the, the Rabbanut has opposed any recognition of, of female modern Orthodox, um, uh, you know, modern Orthodox women who uh, want their sort of um, halachic, you know, Torah scholarship to be recognized. Um, and I think that that is clearly also a one of the reasons why, you know, the source of conflict with the diaspora, not just America, but also in Australian Jewry as well. Um, I think many Australian Jews just particularly on the progressive side, you know, they say, well, how is it possible that I have, it's easier for me to express my Judaism in Australia than it is in, in the state of Israel? Well, this also needs to be done in dialogue. I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the more uh, we get to know each other, the more understanding uh, there will be. Um, I admit that, generally speaking, uh, Israelis, you know, are in many cases think the world uh, revolves around us. Um, you know, I ran a Israeli American high tech company, and um, there's stuff that we could improve upon. Primarily, listening. I mean, really listening. I, I remember the first years in my company. It, it, it was uh, it was just unbelievable the the culture shock. Uh, primarily for the Americans, because the Israelis didn't notice. But, uh, you know, in Israel, it's considered rude to not barge in into a conversation, to actually let the other side finish the question between, be, before you begin answering. In Israel, we have unique physics where you can enter uh, an elevator uh, before the people leave the elevator and somehow it works. So th there's stuff that uh, we have to learn about each other, including here, I think primarily it's an issue of communication. And that's why, you know, projects like uh, Birthright and like to a degree reverse Birthright, as Minister of, uh, of Diaspora, I called myself uh, Minister of the Jews. Uh, I brought 20 different groups of uh, media groups to meet Jewish communities abroad because to, for, for them to have it on the radar screen. And, and that, that's one of the things, and it would certainly also, uh, um, you know, have implications in the areas that you talked about. Um, I think connected to this, and, and you've, you've been quite outspoken on this um, in a number of areas, is, you know, some of the challenges that Israel faces um, with the Haredi community, and, you know, in an economic sense, just the lack of productivity, um, you know, the cost of welfare, but also in terms of integration into Israeli society and um, the fact that, you know, Haredim generally, although from what I can tell, things are improving, but don't serve in the army. And there are all of these sorts of challenges. And it sort of seems to me as, as the sort of outsider sort of viewing things that many, many of the Israeli sort of political class come with very good intentions. And then the horse trading begins as part of the political process and everything sort of gets thrown out along the way. How are we going to resolve this? Because this is a, in, in many ways, a, um, a systemic sort of challenge to, to the state of Israel. And the longer it goes on, the bigger the problem. How are we going to get past the politics to find a solution? Okay, well, Jeremy, you basically talked about two things that are connected but different. Mm -hmm. One is the, the challenge of politicians coming into power and then actually doing good and, and creating an effect. And the second one is how do we tackle the Haredi challenge? Uh, I'll start with the second one. I'll tell you how we don't. Uh, I don't believe in coercion. And while it's uh, profoundly unfair that some Israelis risk their lives, like myself. I was a fighter in Sayeret Matkal. I was a platoon commander, a company commander. I served and, and fought in all wars up to Second Lebanon War. Uh, it's unfair that some risk their lives and others don't. But at the same time, uh, I'm looking to solve the problem, not to fight. So, but we can't force them into it. There's two issues. One is uh, the army service, and the other is uh, being part of the economy and working and paying taxes and, uh, and not being a, a burden on the economy. So my, my take, which is not so popular in Israel, but I, I've, I've been very 
uh, uh, stable on it is to put aside the, the army thing, the army problem, and start with uh, getting them into the, getting them jobs and getting them employed and getting them good education. My sense is if we uh, tackle education and, and jobs first, gradually, within a generation or so, we'll see social pressures uh, getting them to want to join the army. But if we focus on the army, they're going to cloister and, 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 you know, sort of be overprotective and then we won't solve anything. And I'll say another thing the the Sahal is doing fine. You know, we're, we're okay, but the economy will not do fine if a huge portion of Israelis don't work, don't pay taxes. So that the, my, my strategy is economy first. Uh, you know, Lapid's strategy or Lieberman's strategy is military uh, service first. And to be fair, I think it's a political move from their part. I think they know that the truth is that we can't force them, but it, it, it gets you a bunch of votes. Uh, so right now we're, I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, bring upon a move that would release yesh yeshiva students at a younger age, at the age of 21, into the workforce and not compel them to stay until 24 in order to get the military exemption. Yeah. It's a long story, but it, it's, it, it's counterintuitive. The earlier we let them not go to the army, the earlier they'll go in and learn and get a job before they've got uh, five kids and, and a family and, and then they don't have time to get a good job and they get a lousy job and then you know we need to support them throughout their life so that's in a nutshell my my stance regarding exactly. being affected the politician um uh, you know I, I i don't buy the the typical wine of politicians that you can't get stuff done no you can get stuff done if you're very clear about what you want to achieve. Uh, we, we, I, I, as the Minister of Education, uh, I initiated a, a revolution in math and sciences, and we got it done. And suddenly, Arabs and Haredim, and everyone started learning high quality math. As Minister of uh, Defense, within six month, uh, months, I reversed the policy vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Iran and Syria, reversed the policy in Gaza. I left the, the Defense Ministry with a quiet, uh, uh, region and we tackled Corona. I, I don't buy, you know, politicians who whine how tough it is. If 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 you don't want to get stuff done, then then don't become a politician. So Natalie, we we have a question here, sort of on that from the audience, and I was gonna I was gonna go there anyway. Um, but to to, to 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 sort of press you on that because I think the way you've described, and I agree with you, the challenge of getting the harem into the workforce is of critical significance. But, but we have a question here that's asked, but then why is it, when you were education minister, why did you back a law that actually provided further exemptions from the Haredi educational sort of institutions that they wouldn't have to teach, you know, basic things like, you know, maths and, and literacy? Isn't that sort of, you know, one step forward, three steps back? No, uh, here's all what we need to do with the Haredim. It's really simple. Let them let them choose at the age of 21 whether they want to continue in the yeshiva for life or go out and study. That's a, it sounds a, like a small thing and I'm pushing right now to allow that. Um, if we allow that, and I cannot see how someone would resist it because what, what's your case? What, we're not forcing anyone, we're just allowing them. That will go a, a, a long way towards solving the issue. Well, of course, by that point in time, you know, they've gone through a life of schooling and, you know, often don't know basic maths or speak English or... Once you allow them at the age of 21, you'll see social pressures from yeah. below to, to get the education you're talking about. It's, it's a, a lot no of the, an issue of an incentives and intelligent incentives, not of coercion. There's politics. We have to do this smart and get it done understand and so shifting to a sort of different part of Israeli society um, and I've, I've sort of you know followed you and watched you sort of with you know with great interest over the years because you, you can't put Naftali Bennett into a box right you 
you know, I think we all have a very clear understanding of your political views in terms of conflict with the Palestinians, for example. But, um, you know, certainly on social issues, you know, you often come out with positions that, you know, that one wouldn't expect. And I suppose what I, what I wanted to ask you is, in terms of the religious Zionist um, part of, of Israeli society, which, you know, certainly when you start a Jewish home, you know, you, you represent it. And I'm, I suspect you still see yourself as re representing a big part of that community. How do you think that the religious Zionist community has sort of evolved over the last, you know, the last, the last few decades? Where is it at? Is it, is it, you know, is it a strong place? Is it conflicted? Is it focusing on all of the right issues? And what I mean by that is, when we often see people like you come up and, and, and build their way up through the political ladder, you know, you were on record as talking about things, the importance of, you know, bridging gaps between the Chilonim and, and, and not just the Haredim, but also the religious Zionists. Um, a lot of these issues that put the politics aside that go to the core of religious Zionism. Do you feel, do you ever sort of turn around and think, well, we've lost our way a little bit or we disproportionately focus on things like Eretz Israel and um, uh, Greater Israel and instead, in terms of with a religious Zionist add-on, we've sort of forsaken all of those other values that let's say a Yosef Borg or a, um, you know, many others who came before would have would have sort of advocated? Uh, that, that's a very good question. I, I'll tell you. Um, as a, uh, I view myself and I view the, the national religious uh, uh, community as servants of, of the rest of Am Yisrael. So th that's, that's what we're, uh, uh, you know, educated, that's what we're taught at Nakiva, that we're supposed to serve our country. And when I came into this arena about eight years ago, that, that was my message. We're, we're, uh, we're not about taking care of our own interests, but about serving and helping all of Am Yisrael. When I was a commander in the army, I wasn't the commander of the religious soldiers in my company or platoon. I was the commander of of everyone. When I was a CEO in high tech, I wasn't the CEO of the Datiim of, of everyone. When I was a minister of education or minister of defense, I was of all Am Yisrael. And to a great degree, I've been uh, criticized for not being sectorial enough. And I uh, plead guilty. Uh, you're right. I, I, I'm not sectorial because that, that's not what I'm about. I'm about all of Am Yisrael, by the way, diaspora as well. Um, so, the answer is yes, we, we, but we, we need to recalibrate uh, and, and focus on, on the big things. For example, right now, uh, uh, unemployment, um, small businesses that, that are in, in very difficult times, COVID-19, this is the issue of the day and, and, and we should all be focusing on Arvuta Dadit and helping out, figuring out how together we can you know, get through this very, very difficult period um, and, and not be only one issued. Do I care about Eretz Israel? Oh yeah, profoundly. Am I against giving up land? Absolutely. Um, and do I believe in, in, in uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu? Yes. But is this the sole issue that I have to deal with? Absolutely not. The way I view it is, is we have to take care of Am Israel, and when we do that, uh, ultimately, the, the political reward would also follow. But, but uh, so, so that's sort of a big clash going on, and, and my position is, is uh, incredibly clear. And, and you know, you, you sort of drew a bit of a line in the sand in, in the last election um, when you came out against Otsma joining, um, you know, sort of forming part of the coalition or joining Beit Yildi. Um, what what was it? I mean, you know, everyone you know has their different lines, but what was it about the prospect of Otsma joining you and being associated with you that you sort of was too much for you? Because politically, I think many would have said it would have been expedient for you to accept it, and it, it seems it seemed from the outside that you took a position of principle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll I'll 
I want, I want to understand my guidelines and, and then you can understand it. And, and just sorry, Naftali, just maybe for the audience, because not everyone is, is familiar with it. It's Otsma, um, you know, it, it was a political party that many um, would have described as based on, um, you know, or consists of supporters of the late Meir Kahana um, and whose party was banned from running in the Knesset um, on the basis that it was, it was racist. So I'll just give that context before you answer. Um, so... There's lots of things that are not perfect in Israel, but when something is an imperfect in, in our country, you go fix it. You don't bypass it. If uh, the police is not perfect, then you try and improve the police. If the military is imperfect, you try and improve the military. If the uh, uh, Supreme Court is imperfect, you try and improve it. Uh, I will never associate myself with an ideology that says the state of Israel uh, as a sovereign state is, is nice, but what really matters is only Eretz Israel or Torah Israel, because that, that, that will destroy our country. It's something very fundamental. So I don't want to refer to anyone specific. I'm, I'm, I'm very mamlachti, which means I view the state of Israel as, as a such an important uh, 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 entity that, that, you know, that's what we craved for for 2,000 years. We didn't crave only to be in the land of Israel as, as individual Jews. Because, you know, someone in, you know, 1,250 could come to the land of Israel, but that's not what we're talking about, living as an individual under, a, 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 you know, a foreign sovereignty. What we were looking for is, is the Jewish state, which we had 3,000 years ago in, uh, during the Maccabim, a Jewish state, which is governed by a Jewish government uh, that, that's in charge of, of education and paving roads and, and, and applying law. And when anyone undermines that and says, you know, we're gonna take the law into our hands, we, the, the army's not doing a good enough job, we'll form our own army. That's off limits from my perspective because that'll dismantle the very basis. And, and I'm very frustrated sometimes with the government, but look what I did. I joined government to fix it and I'm in opposition to fix it. I don't break the system just because I'm unhappy. And, and, you know, I, I want to read it out because you, you were quoted um, at the time, and I think it's quite powerful, it, it echoes this, and you said, our parents did not come to Israel to be partisan militias on the hilltops because that will dismantle everything we've built. And, you know, I thought, I thought they were very powerful words. So, so let me now take you in a sort of slightly different direction, but using that same, that same quote where, where effectively what, as I understood what you were saying, was that the, the, the very basis of this ideology um, challenges, you know, the state of Israel as the home of the Jewish people, as sort of the vision of, of the prophets call it. Now, there are there are many in, in relation. If we move on to this talk about this this issue of application of sovereignty or annexation, whatever one wants to call it, um, there are those. Now, I know you've. It's complicated. And many outside of Israel don't appreciate it. That you know, you you came out um, and opposed this um, because you thought it was, you know as I understood it, you're part of the Trump plan, which ultimately you didn't think was in the interests of the state of Israel. And I want to get to that in a minute, but what I want to ask you is there are many in the diaspora and in Israel who, when they look at, you know, these, these plans of annexation, whether or not it's um, particularly if it's large areas of the West Bank that include Palestinian population centres, that they turn around and they say, sort of make the same point that you were making in relation to Otsma. And their argument is, I oppose this not because... I think that your Davis Shamron, the West Bank, is not part of the Jewish home. Um, I oppose it not because I disagree that Israel um, you know, has rights to this land, but I oppose it because it's going to put Israel in a situation whereby they permanently control the lives of millions of Palestinians without any pathway to citizenship or independence, and therefore you know, how do we sort of, um, how does one come to terms with this um, if Israel is to remain a Jewish and a democratic state? How do, you, how do you view this? Where does this end? We understand, you've said you're against giving up land. Um, you're not, you don't agree that there should be um, a Palestinian state. 
And there are a lot of very good reasons for that position. You know, we, we understand the world we live in, the environment that Israel is in. But I suppose the question is, where does this end? If it's not there, how does this end in a way that Israel can remain a Jewish and democratic state? So, um, uh, you know, about almost a decade ago, I put forward a plan called the Sovereignty Plan uh, when everyone was talking uh, Palestinian state. And, and now I'm happy that Israel's uh, uh, moving towards uh, this uh, direction. Uh, we're talking about applying sovereignty on maximum land and the minimal amount of number of uh, Palestinians. In the current plan, it, it's in the hundreds. So it's almost insignificant. Um, when we apply sovereignty on, on a person and he becomes part of the state of Israel, we offer that individual uh, one of three options, uh, full citizenship, including, including voting for the Knesset, uh, residency, like the green card in Israel, where you're everything but you don't vote if that's what you opt for, or to continue being a full citizen of the PA. So it doesn't create uh, any uh, demographic pressure. Um, and that's what we're saying here. Uh, the, the Palestinian Authority has a, an autonomy, a very lousy one, a very corrupt one, a very terror-ridden one, uh, and they can continue running that. While in the Israeli-applied uh, uh, sovereignty areas, it becomes Israel. So there's no issue of uh, apartheid, while at the same time, there's no issue of a uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, Palestinian state. There's no perfect solution. I suggest that folks uh, check out the sovereignty plan. Um, it, it's not very different than what it was about eight years ago. I've got time for one last question, Jeremy. So, okay, uh, so sorry, we'll, we'll, then I'll move on because we've got lots of questions. Um, about, apologize. You, you, no, no, that's okay. We under, you did tell us you only had 45 minutes. So I'll, 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 skip, I'll jump off to the next subject. Um, where there are a lot of questions around, you've been very vocal most recently around the government's handling of COVID-19. Um, and you, you, you've sort of made you know, a bunch of sort of suggestions and proposals. What would you do if you were the prime minister today? I would appoint a COVID-19 czar, uh, provide him the resources and the authority to build the system for, um, for controlling, getting control over the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, pandemic, And, uh, you know, as a defense minister in the first round, I did it. Um, I sort of became the, that czar. I, uh, and we did a very good job. We built uh, 30 uh, COVID uh, hotels for isolation and quarantine. We um, uh, uh, developed the advanced systems. We took care of 300,000 uh, elderly people and protected them. And that's why we have such a low number of uh, fatalities. Uh, then the government was replaced and, and sort of uh, they, they celebrated victory way too early and it's not being uh, managed well right now. But what, what I don't like doing, I, I don't want to criticize my own government when I'm speaking abroad. So, you know, my criticism, I, I, uh, I'll... I'll uh, be very vocal about within Israel. Well, um, Natalia, and we know you need to go. Thank you very much. Um, we wish you and, and ourselves and everyone, but particularly everyone in, in Israel, um, good health. And, you know, I hope we all have the strength to get through this crisis um, and see each other on the other side. And thank you for your time and all of your efforts. Thank you. And I just want to tell you, we care about you guys a lot. Shanaba um, Birushalayim. Take care. Thank you, Colton. Well, thank you, Naftali. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we all get a, uh, an early mark tonight um, because, uh, because Naftali had to go. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. Uh, remember, next week we will have Yaakov Katz, who is the editor of the Jerusalem Post. Um, and uh, we can't wait to speak to him. Until then, we uh, have a safe week and we'll see you next week. Good night.